Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I am excited to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, if that's okay. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Excellent. Let me do that and make it a slideshow. Minimize this. Excellent. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Good. I'm going to move this little, just trying to move the, there it goes. Excellent. Well, good. Um, good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yang and colleagues for the honor of this uh, uh, invitation uh, to, to, to join you today. Let me see if I can get the slides. There we go. Uh, these are my um, these are my declarations. Um, I, I I don't believe any of them is germane to um, to the talk today. I, I will point out I'm a member of the Fleischner Society, which um, makes guidelines for one of the aspects of what I'm going to be uh, talking about today. Um, I think that may be the only relevant uh, thing to declare. All right, so today I'm going to cover with you um, lung cancer from the perspective of uh, populations in the United States. Um, we will make the case that there is more than one way to find lung cancer early. Talk about the implementation implications of the two approaches to early detection. And then maybe home in on a specific project, the uh, what we call our deluge in the Mississippi Delta project, which is an acronym uh, detecting early lung cancer in the Mississippi Delta. And then we we'll talk about directions that we hope to take this work. So, so the good news, of course, you heard, uh, bad as it's been for so long, this century long global pandemic that is lung cancer, um, in the United States at, at least is turning out to be a good story. We're moving from the age of darkness into an age of light. In, indicated by that red line for men at the top, women at the bottom, the incidence uh, of lung cancer continues to go down in the United States and commensurately with that, the mortality from lung cancer continues to go down, first for men starting in the 1990s, and then for women about a decade and a half to two decades later. The story also continues to uh, improve because um, the distribution of uh, lung cancer by stage is also changing. So um, this, this is from the US Cancer Report 2022. Uh, showing that the proportion of lung cancer patients with distant disease uh, has been drifting downwards. And then sometime around 2015, you see that inflection sharply downwards. And commensurately with that, the proportion of patients with local disease in green uh, drifting upwards, and then about 2015, a sharp upward inflection. All very good. So what happened around 2015? We know that in 2011, the first results of the National Lung Screening Trial were published, very positive. We know that in 2013, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force came out with its recommendation for screening very positive. And we know that in 2015, Medicare, uh, the Medicare coverage decision in support of payment coverage for lung cancer screening came about. So, so it is very fascinating that right around then we saw the sharp redistribution of lung cancer in the direction that we would predict and certainly desire to see. That's the feel-good story. 
But we must not forget that that story is not uniform everywhere. So this is the lung cancer mortality map of America. Uh, you see the dates there, but this map remains the same, even with contemporary data. The states in red are the states with the highest per capita incidence and mortality for lung cancer. The leaderboard, of course, we know it's Kentucky number one, Mississippi number two, Arkansas number three, West Virginia number four, Tennessee number five. Um, the reason why the map is the way it is, is not far-fetched. Uh, this is the per capita smoking rates in the United States, essentially the same map. And if we fragment the US map to the county level, you find the story is even more disturbing. Because what you see here is a color-coded map of the evolution of lung cancer mortality at the county level, where green is a reduction, red, pink, purple, an ongoing increase. So we know that the aggregate incidence and mortality statistics in the United States are steadily downward. But at the county level, the story is much more mixed. So there are counties in the United States in which lung cancer as a cause of mortality is still rising. And you see those pink, red, purple counties. Those are the places in which that's still happening. And the darker the pink, red, purple, the worse those statistics are. So my healthcare system, the Baptist Memorial Healthcare Corporation, is within that blue circle. We have facilities in West Tennessee, Eastern Arkansas, and uh, North and Central Mississippi. And if my healthcare system, with 1,200 to 1,300 annual lung cancer cases, new lung cancer cases, was arrayed out on the state's leaderboard, um, we would have more lung cancer cases every year than 12 of the 50 United States. So we have been forced to accept that we are burdened with this challenge of lung cancer. And we feel that the, the challenge is so great, we needed to come with a with an organized approach to tackling it. And so we came up with this framework, uh, this population impact pyramid. If we were to do something to dent the lung cancer mortality at the population level, where should we spend our resources? Clearly the biggest bang for buck is tobacco control. The next biggest bang for buck, of course, is early detection. Um, we know that low-dose screening saves lives, low-dose CT screening saves lives, but we also somewhat serendipitously, as I'll share with you in a little bit, demonstrated that guideline concordant management of incidentally detected lung nodules also saves lives. The purpose of early detection, of course, is to make sure the right patient gets the right treatment, especially to increase the proportions that get curative intent treatment. So we've done a lot of work looking at surgical quality, pathology quality, and obviously creating access to clinical trials to our patients. But today I'm gonna to focus on the two programs, uh, management of incidentally detected lung nodules and low dose screening CT. Now we've taken these seven programs, including the two I'm gonna talk about, and applied three rigorous sciences to them in this crazy real world environment that's served by my healthcare system. So population science, understanding who we serve, what their needs are and the challenges in delivering care. Team science, who's gonna do this work? Making sure that the teams, the multidisciplinary teams come together and fu function appropriately and then dissemination and implementation science, making sure that when evidence is generated, 
we apply it at the place where lives get saved. So I'm going to talk about the two early detection programs. First, low-dose screening CT. We know, of course, that we have two large randomized control trials that have clearly demonstrated that low-dose screening CT saves lives. We know that there is a third trial, the MILD trial, the Italian study, that later on demonstrated a very similar result. And we know that there are meta-analyses that clearly establish that low-dose screening saves lives. The challenge, of course, is can we do this at home? So we have run into a lot of implementation barriers. In spite of the evidence that screening saves lives, we have not been able to get everybody who is a candidate screened. Adoption rates have been depressingly low. In most analyses, less than 10% of people eligible have actually had a screening test. And of course, the reality is all over the world, other than the United States and now the United Kingdom and one or two other countries, screening is not policy. So basically no adoption anywhere else. We know that the eligibility criteria are imperfect. The eligibility criteria came about in trying to enrich the clinical trial population so that you could test a hypothesis. Unfortunately, that has naturally led to the idea that the evidence is based on these people. And even though they don't capture everybody at rest, that is where we continue to be. And inadvertently, we are finding that after discovery, of course, disparities emerge, and we are already seeing that challenge. So to illustrate this, this map I showed you in color earlier, now in black and white, this is the lung cancer mortality map of America. And here is the low-dose CT screening program map of America. When the, Ameri the ACR registry was mandated, um, you could ask the question, where are ACR accredited certified facilities? You see that dense cluster in the Northeast. You see a little bit of a cluster in Florida and a little bit in California. You, what you don't see is the density of programs in the place where lung cancer mortality is most dense. I call this the equivalent of a ventilation perfusion mismatch. The places where lung cancer kills are not the places where we have been most facile in deploying our resources for early detection. So we see Kentucky as a good outlier High institution uh, state um, per capita incidence and mortality, number one on the leaderboard, and way up there in terms of screening facilities. And then we see all those institutions in the blue, those states in the blue circle. So number two, I said, was Mississippi, MS. Number three, Arkansas, AR. Number four, West Virginia, WB. Number five, Tennessee, TN. All inside that circle low implementation and high incidence. Massachusetts, of course, is way up at the top. But of course, the other thing to point out is none of us has anything to pump our chest about. So even Massachusetts way up there, only 16% of eligible people have had a screening test. The eligibility criteria are just not quite right. So here is a wonderful analysis done by Paul Pinsky, just basically estimating the eligibility for screening versus the incidence of lung cancer by, by race and sex. So this is one for men. The first bar is non-Hispanic white males, the second bar, non-Hispanic black males, the gray bar, um, Hispanic men, and the orange bar, Asian men. So the way this works is the higher the bar, the better the relationship between eligibility and incidence. And you see five different 
potential eligibility criteria, the first cluster of four bars is um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force criteria from 2013. The second cluster of four is the new criteria, uh, the 2021 criteria. The next cluster is the NCCN uh, criteria. The next one is an expanded a uh, set of criteria uh, looking at the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force now saying we're going to allow people who quit as far ago as 25 years to be eligible. And then the, 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 the fifth cluster of four is the PLCO 2012 cri um, criteria, uh, the Tamamagi risk calculator. And you see the relationship is the same. White men best deal everybody else a distant second third fourth and asian men actually sort of get the rawest deal of all same pattern with women except now you can say that women all together get a rawer deal than men because if you look at the scale you find that the bars even for white women are lower than the bars for white men. So our eligibility criteria actually inadvertently drive access disparities. Is there another way? Well, you know, maybe there is. Um, we, in this day and age, at least in the Western world, do a lot of radiologic images for many different reasons. We probably overuse radiologic images. But here is a patient who had a CAT scan. February, you might see in the right upper lobe, a little lesion. June, the same year, 2020, a lesion a little bigger. And then April, 2021, patient presents with back pain, another scan, lesion bigger, and now invading into the vertebra. This turned out to be a patient who for different reasons came to the emergency room, had a chest CT scan, each of which the radiologist identified the presence of a lesion that needed intervention that wasn't provided. Can we take this lemon and make lemonade of it? So the use of CT imaging continues to rise. That has been a concern, a problem, but could you use that concern, that problem, for good. So the idea of identifying long nodules done, um, identifying long nodules on images done for whatever reason, we know has guidelines around it. There are guidelines, the Flashman Society, for example, has had guidelines for managing these incidentally detected long nodules. The nice thing about that is that if you have an if you have a lesion in the lung and you follow the guidelines, you are starting from the point of an already identified radiologic lesion that could be a lung cancer. So now the issue of LDCT eligibility criteria are no longer relevant. And the barriers that come with trying to identify who needs to be nagged about getting a test that they maybe don't want because Although they're healthy, they're a certain age and they have a sm certain smoking history, uh, you, you don't have to deal with it at all. It leverages already existing material. The test has been done. The radiologist has identified the presence of a lesion that needs something to be done about it. And, you know, it doesn't really matter where this test was done, ER or any other place. Different populations who come to different places to, to get these tests already done. And of course, the issue of you've taken the picture. The radiologist has said, somebody, please do something about this. Now, there's a lot of nihilism about lung cancer, but there's also legal jeopardy. The idea, therefore, of getting healthcare systems to maybe pay some attention to invest in the infrastructure to avoid this medical legal quandary becomes an easier sell, maybe, than developing a whole new program uh, to screen for lung cancer. It does require some infrastructure to do this effectively and safely. 
And it certainly requires interdisciplinary decision making to keep it safe. I'm going to talk about our deluge in the Mississippi Delta project. This is a paper we just pub we published earlier this year, our first cut look at um, our uh, pro program. So back in 2014, we knew after the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force came out that screening was going to become a covered entity. We also knew we were not ready for it and that it was going to be a difficult, complex task. And we wanted to begin to experiment to figure out how we were going to do it. So we happened on the idea that we could start out with the processes to ensure guideline concurrent management of incidentally detected long nodules. So we set up an, a prospective observational um, data collection mechanism. We came up with a way to capture uh, the radiology reports in which the radiologists had identified the presence of a lesion using um, a, a natural language uh, uh, approach that allowed our EHR, our Electronic Health Record System, EPIC, to be able to capture such reports, put them in a queue, and then we had these navigators who we trained to use the Fleischner Society's guidelines to triage patients into various risk levels and then subsequently act upon the referral of such patients into various levels of intensity. Uh, High-risk patients were triaged into our multidisciplinary forum. So shortly after we started that program in early 2015, the Medicare coverage decision came about and suddenly we were able to pivot and start our screening program. So serendipitously, we have these two parallel programs started within the same calendar year. And I'm just gonna show you some of the early results. So starting out in 2015, you see the cumulated number of persons enrolled in the nodule program, the blue line, and the screening program, the orange line. And you see the relationship there. For every one person enrolled in the screening program, we had three people in the nodule program. The point, of course, is to find lung cancer. And this is the accumulated number of persons diagnosed with lung cancer through the screening program in orange and the nodule program in blue. And here you see the relationship for every one lung cancer patient found through the screening program, eight lung cancer patients in the nodule program. The NLST had a lung cancer detection rate in the screen, the CTR screening arm of about 1.1%. In our high-risk region, ours was 2.8%. But the nodule program is 6.2%. So what do we get out of this? The stage distribution of lung cancers found in the two early detection programs, very similar. So the, the combination of stage one and two in our screening program, which is the blue bar, is about 60 something percent. The nodule program, very similar. The black bar is, is somewhat um, unsatisfactory control group that we came up with, wanting to contextualize our early detection lung cancer programs. So these are patients in our multidisciplinary program, a multidisciplinary thoracic oncology program, who did not get their lung cancer diagnosed through either of the early detection programs. So these are people conventionally diagnosed and referred in you see that the proportion with stage one and two lung cancers is lower and the reciprocal is true. Stage four and stage three, the middle and the uh, right cluster of bars, um, the control group proportion higher than the two early detection. So that's within program proportions. Now, when we did this analysis, there were approximately 1800 lung cancer patients across the three programs. And when you ask the question, which program gives you the greatest yield of early stage patients, you suddenly see that blue and green are not neck to neck anymore. 
the screening program and the nodule program, the nodule program in green gives you a significantly higher proportion of the stage one and two lung cancer patients than the blue, the low dose screening program. And then when you, you remember that the point of early detection is to be able to get people to curative intent treatment. Once again, you see the two early detection programs fairly similar. So the first triplet of bars is the proportion of patients who went to surgery and didn't need any other treatment, meaning they had super early stage. The second triplet is people who had surgery, but also got some other modality of treatment, uh, whether it's neoadjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy, but they also, they all had surgery. So now talking about patients with somewhat higher stage in addition to the early stage ones. And then the combination of surgery and or SBRT, which is itself also a curative treatment modality. You see that the proportions between blue and green are neck to neck, well, reasonably close, although blue, the screening program is, is higher than green. But once again, if you ask about the whole population, where are your patients who wind up going to curative intent treatment mostly coming from? It is the green, the nodule program gives you the highest proportion of patients able to go to surgery and not need any other treatment. And then you see any surgery and surgery and or SBRT. Certainly the relationship between blue and green, fairly consistent. The nodule program gives you a bigger bang for your buck. And of course, the whole point is to promote survival. And here we see the survival plots. The patients diagnosed with lung cancer through the screening program, blue, have the best survival of the lot. Remember, these are healthy patients. To be eligible, you gotta be healthy, but old enough to be eligible, and your smoking history makes you eligible. The nodule pro program patients are different. These are people who had a problem that led to the diagnosis, to the scan that led to the identification of a cancer. So you had a heart attack, you had chest pain, you went to the ER, you were having a heart attack. Yes, we had to take care of your heart attack first, even though we found there was a lesion that needed attention. And only after that could we come back later on. You know, so these are some of the anecdotal explanations for why you see the difference. But you clearly see that the two early detection programs lead to much better survival than even the cherry-picked multi-D cohort that we used as a control group for this purpose. So who are these patients? Are they all the same? Are they different? They are different. I remind you that the national lung screening trial accrued 4.6% African-Americans. Of course, in my part of the country, we have a higher African-American population and my LDCT program, the lung cancer patients diagnosed in it, 16% of them were black. In my healthcare system, about 30%, 25 to 30% of all lung cancer patients are black in my healthcare system. In the lung nodule program, you see that properly represented. So African-Americans gain access to early detection more frequently through the lung nodule program than through the screening program. We know that if you have lungs, you can get lung cancer, but if you don't smoke, you can't get lung cancer screening. So of course, none of the patients diagnosed with lung cancer through the screening program was somebody who had never smoked. 13% of both the nodule cohort and the healthcare systems cohorts with lung cancer were people who had never smoked. We also know that unfortunately, a high proportion of the patients who participate in screening are people who are actively smoking, but a significant proportion have already quit. 
So the median quit duration of lung cancer patients through the screening program is about eight years. The, those who have quit smoking, their median quit duration is eight years. In the nodule program, the median quit duration is 16 years. What does that mean? That means that more than half of the patients in the nodule program who had quit smoking would have been ineligible for screening. Once again, showing you the different segments of the lung cancer population who gain access to early detection through the nodule program. And one of the things that we have found, of course, is that lung cancer screening is even more effective in Black people. Unfortunately, of course, the eligibility criteria are not quite equitable for Black people, Hispanic people, and Asians. So what's the rub? Um, in our long nodule program cohorts, fewer than half of the lung cancer patients would have been eligible for screening, whether by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force 2013 criteria or the new improved 2021 criteria, which was actually designed to open access to more patients. In fact, if 100% of the patients who were eligible by U.S. Preventive Services Task Force 2021 criteria in my data set of the 1,800 patients with cancer, with lung cancer, if 100% of those who were eligible by the current criteria had actually undergone LDCT, had been diagnosed through LDCT screening, the nodule program would still have accounted for 20% of all the early stage lung cancers in the cohort. I think the point here is that these programs are complementary. And so if we accept that, then we begin to try to understand what is the risk comparison? If you have a patient in a nodule program, there, the spectrum of tobacco exposure is wide. So, so how do we contextualize these patients is one interesting question. So what I'm showing you here is all the people in the screening and the nodule programs their cumulative rates of diagnosis of lung cancer from the point of enrollment into the program. Green is the nodule cohort, blue the screen cohort. So if you just mash them all up, you see that starting from the point of, an, of a lesion detected, irrespective of anything else we know about you, puts you at higher risk than people who we identify with current LDCT criteria as worthy of undergoing screening for lung cancer. And if you separated them out by age, above and below, say, Medicare age 65, you find that that difference remains. So the blue remains the LDCT, the solid blue are people younger than age 65, the uh, the, the dotted blue, those older than 65. Green is the long nodule uh, cohort. Solid green, less than 65. Uh, dotted green, greater than 65. Now, you can continue to ask the question to try to contextualize the screening. We know that Flashner Society guidelines recommend that they're only applicable to people th 35 years of age and above. Clearly, those people are way too young to be screened. They are not eligible for lung cancer screening. So too young is defined as people below the age of 50, which is the lower age limit by the current U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. The green, too young to be screened, but in the nodule program. The next le level, green, which is a little bit covered by the solid blue line, that is patients 
who are old enough to be screened, so between the age of 50 and 80 years, but ineligible because of their smoking history. Didn't smoke, didn't smoke enough, or quit too long ago. The next green is those too old to be screened, older than age 80. And the solid green, those age eligible and tobacco exposure history eligible. So people who should have had a low dose screening CT scan but didn't in my healthcare system. You can further slice and dice this and say, wait a minute, if you're starting from the point of a nodule in the nodule program, that's not fair. The screen cohorts who are long grads one and two, they don't have a nodule, but you do have long grads three and four who have a nodule. What this shows you is that several subsets of the nodule program cohort, irrespective of age or smoking history, their risk is at least that of long grads one and two patients, high risk patients, who we have encouraged and been able to get to undergo screening. And the nodule cohort who are eligible for screening are the equivalent of long grads three and four. So that's kind of where we are with the deluge program. Um, what are we proposing to do next? Obviously, we're disseminating this across our healthcare system and we're pushing this story for others to emulate in their programs. Um, there's a need to understand, is this a regional phenomenon? I mean, how generalizable are our findings? And try to figure out what difference will this make on our population at the end of the day? And is there some way to improve the efficiency of lung cancer risk stratification in this cohort? So first, um, let me just show you my healthcare system, I said 12 to 1300 annual lung cancer cases. Um, here we are. Um, I showed you the, the comparison in the paper we published, green, blue, and black. Red is everybody else in my healthcare system with lung cancer who did not receive care through one of these three programs. And you see that Actually, the control group, the, the multi-D cohort was actually with a better outcome than everybody else in the system. We're disseminating these programs across our region. So the first map just shows you our state level catchment area. We cover parts of counties in six states. Um, the red circles are the people enrolled in our long nodule program, the yellow circles in the other map, those in the screening program. And this is how the patients within our programs have kind of somehow leaked into our program, mostly from the places where we have infrastructure. But obviously you see the map, there are patients who have come in from multiple other places. So trying to figure out generalizability, we did some analysis of CM Medicare data, data sets. And what we, had, what we are able to show is that that ratio of one to eight that we found, screening versus nodule, the ratio is nine to one in the US population. The survival plots, whether you look at lung cancer specific survival or overall survival, red patients screened in the CM Medicare cohort, the next line, black, I think that is, patients who had a lung cancer diagnosed after a diagnosis code for, an, for a lung nodule, and then the purple, everybody else, the majority. You see the relationships that we demonstrated in our regional cohort seem to be holding up. So my take home message is today, incidental lung nodule programs, they give you an alternative pathway to detect lung cancer early epidemiologically powerful, may rescue more people than LDCT does. And we feel that these programs are complementary and they need to be implemented together. And of course, 
you can do a long nodule program anywhere. You don't need anybody's approval of screening to be able to do this. So what we want to do is avoid this. Set another patient, you see the long nodule in the left lung, October 2020, and you see the long mass, February 2022. The radiologist identified the nodule, nothing was done, and the patient presents with that huge long mass two years later. So this is work which has been funded um, by my healthcare system that I shared with you today. Some of this has been published. A lot more of it is still in the pipeline. And I thank you for your kind invitation to share with you today. I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Great, thank you so much. The, that was fantastic. That, that was absolutely fantastic. And we really appreciate Dr. Acer Giovan for presenting today. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Alex Anderson, to start off the question and discussion. But we have a wide audience here. We have an audience of students and doctors. And for our student audience, um, I'm wondering, can you show us that second to last slide you had and just walk walk some of us through those CT scans to um, tell them why, because uh, it's, it's really, it's a very striking picture. And this is really highlights why we want to try to aim for early detection of lung cancer. I know you already gave an overview, but if you wouldn't mind just maybe. Yes, um, let me, uh, I, I'm trying to figure out the technology. Uh, I think, okay, <laughs> I, I, I might have skipped a step. Okay, I think I got it. Can you see my slide now? Yeah, I see your slide deck. Yes. I haven't seen Let this slide yet. Yes. The, no, is this That's the right, one? That, that slide, yeah. Mm, it's uh, not, it's, you, let me see here. Yeah. I don't know why it's not wanting to show up no. in slide. Well, no. I, I guess we can, um, we can see it pretty clearly there already, yeah. So for the medical students, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but yes. yes, okay. So there is a nodule, okay? It's in the left upper lobe. You can see the same nodule. You can see in the mediastinum, we don't really see anything that looks of concern for metastatic disease. But unfortunately, so this was October, 2020, patient comes in for whatever reason, got that scan for something different, but the radiologist in the institution where this patient went, this was not one of our deluge patients, um, mentioned the presence of a nodule and recommended that Fleischner Society guidelines be, um, be followed in, 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 in surveilling the lesion, but nothing got done until the patient came in with symptoms to the emergency room, and you can see this huge mass. So in less than two years, we have gone from this, which would have been a tip shot for Dr. Yang to go in and take care of, okay? And chances are the patient would have been one and done to this, where if Dr. Yang is gonna be able to do anything, this patient is gonna to have to have neoadjuvant chemotherapy and immunotherapy first, before we can even dream of taking him to the operating room. Clearly, we went from stage 1A, probably stage 1A1 or stage 1A2, to stage 3A at, at best, maybe even more advanced than that. So the point here is, if there had been infrastructure to follow the radiologist's recommendation that somebody should follow Fleischner Society guidelines in managing this patient, this person probably would have had their lung cancer identified and managed well before it became blindingly obvious what was wrong with them. Yeah, th 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 thank you for that. I, I think for, for those in our audience who are, um, 
uh, uh, still on this journey of learning medicine. Th th these are very striking images. The, as Dr. Osero Giovan was mentioning, if you look at the picture on the right, that's a tiny nodule. That's that's about less than a, it's about the size of a quarter. The and then, but in a mere 16 months, that has grown to the size of um, it's it's the same size as the heart. Actually, the the patient's heart is about the same size as the patient's cancer now, which is it's huge. It's uh you know probably um, a, a grapefruit and a half, or maybe even two grapefruits. Uh, size. So um, just really striking. And uh, but obviously what Dr. Osir, uh, Osir Giobon's work has shown is that most of the time he's actually their institution is preventing this kind of situation with the with his very innovative lung nodule program and also the low dose CT screening program. So thank you. Um, all right, great. A Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you now. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. O, for your amazing presentation. And I speak for everyone when we say that you're an inspiration to all of us and um, where we where we look to go in the future of lung cancer screening and 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 everything like that. We're now going to open the, the floor to questions. So we asked people we'd prefer that you would unmute yourself to ask questions. So uh, Dr. O can see you when you ask them. But if you are uncomfortable doing so, you can also put your questions in the chat and we will we will say those for you and we will do this for about 10 to 15 minutes to end our, our lecture. Thank you. Uh, awesome. I guess I can start us off uh, and go first. So just want to say thank you so much, Echo what Alex Anderson had just said. It was a really wonderful presentation, and I learned a lot. Um, I was curious, uh, two questions. So one, in your graphs comparing the stage distribution between the different programs, you grouped one and two together. And so I was curious if you looked by like one and two separately or even by substage, if you saw a clustering of like 1A in your LDCT group were larger, but still early stage. Yes, yes. yes, thank you, Alex. That's a great question. So we did that for convenience, uh, for practicality. I think the point um, of that cluster that we did was just to make a point, well, you know, stage one and two patients, traditionally we think of as, yes, a straight line to the surgeon's uh, suite. Uh, stage three, maybe we need to all interact before we decide which way we go. And stage four, mostly palliative treatment. So, that, so we did that just to sort of cluster that along the lines of decision-making at the time. Uh, obviously, some of that is also changing as we speak with new adjuvant therapy. But um, to answer your question, yes, um, the two programs are also neck and neck, even when you split the, uh, the, the early stage into the finer slices, uh, 1A, 1B, uh, 2A, 2B. Fairly similar. As we are going on, what, what we're, what, you know, so that analysis I showed you, we censored, I think, March uh, 2021, 2021 March, yes, last year. Uh, obviously, we continue to disseminate our programs across my far-flung healthcare systems. So, for example, as of, uh, you know, um, I believe uh, October or August of this year, I showed you 700 and something patients in the nodule program. We actually have 1,800 lung cancer patients in the nodule program now. And the screening cohort is uh, about 250 thereabouts. And we're seeing that the stage comparison, uh, you know, when we did this analysis, there was no statistical difference in the stage distribution between the two early, uh, early detection programs. But now we're seeing the screen cohort is slightly uh, higher in terms of an uh, early stage than the nodule cord. Not quite sure why that is. It may just be that the infrastructure for the nodule program we, in metropolitan Memphis, we've had deep experience now going back to 2015. In some of the other parts of my healthcare system, they're just learning how to do this. And part of me wonders whether the decision-making process in those places uh, don't need to be tightened as we go along. But but great, great, fabulous question. Thank you. And then my second question was, I was curious, because there's a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about adherence in LDCT screening programs. 
um, and how it's not as great as people would like it to be. And so I was curious if you see similar rates of adherence to, I know you, it sounds like you use different criteria bet between the two programs, but if you see similar rates or different rates between the two. It's a great question. A great question, Alex. Uh, by way of background, I'll remind everyone, the National Long Screen Trial had a, an adherence rate of uh, 95%. Okay, so that, that's called the healthy volunteer effect. Life doesn't usually work that way. Um, so the uh, Gerald Silvestri and the National Lung Cancer Roundtable just published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, the first 1.5 million or so people in the ACR registry. And what they showed was in this real world, everybody in the real world implementation uh, experience, that, that adherence rate is 21%. So much, much lower than desired. In my healthcare system, the adherence rate for our screening program is something we're looking at right now. Ours is at 27% for the screening program. For the nodule program, it is much higher than that. It's, it's in the 50 something, 60% range. But clearly we need to do a lot of work because I think what you're really hinting at Alex is that the long-term benefit, the, the, the greatest benefit we're going to get from screening is not from that first picture we take. It's not the T0 scan. It's the ones that we do years later because we already see that the lung cancer is diagnosed in the subsequent CT scans, the one done year two, three, four, and on and down, what we call the incidence scans. So the first scan is the prevalent scan, and then the rest of them are so-called incident scans. The stage distribution in the lung cancer is diagnosed with incidence scans is much more favorable, closer to stage one, than um, what you find with the early on. So adherence really matters. Uh, screening, even though the NLST did only three, three interval scans, um, the U.S. Services Task Force and Medicare have correctly recommended that screening be an annual event until you hit the upper limit age. So the issue of adherence is really vital to make sure people get that full benefit. Sorry. Great question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can, can I just um, ask a quick follow up to that? Um, do you know? Uh, why there is the that difference in the adherence rate between the lung, lung nodule program and the LDCT screening yeah, and yeah. the related yeah, question good, is, um, yeah. So, so the, yeah. all I can do is speculate. We're analyzing that data. I can sort of describe patterns. So I think the first thing one would say is there's a difference between, well, doctor and doctor, you go get a CAT scan, the CAT scan was done and they said you were long grads one or two, meaning, oh, what, what gets going to you don't have lung cancer. Your CAT scan was normal. So yeah. I guess part of my speculation is people hear that and think, oh, okay, good. Thank God. You can smoke away. The nodule people, we said, look, there's a spot. And we're worried it could be lung cancer. We think you've got to come back in three months, six months, whatever. Um, I, I think people are more likely to pay attention. And of course, the other thing I must say is our nodule program has higher touch than the screening program. The screening program is a conventional screening program and our navigators are not embedded, at least not yet in that program, but they are in my nodule program. They, they're actively calling people and their doctors. So they call the doctor first and say, look, your patient came through the ER yesterday, had a CAT scan and it showed a lesion. Do you want us to manage it for you, yes or no? And if the answer is no, leave my patient alone. Well, they do that. But if the answer is yes, please, then they call the patient and say, look, you had a spot, your CAT scan showed a lesion. We think you need a, a scan in three months, six months, whatever, one year. We're going to set it up for you. And then they follow up with those patients. So I think that's, in some degree, part of what's going on here. Great. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for answering that. Uh, we'll go to Mahima. She has a question and then we'll we'll go to Arnav after that. Thank you. Yeah, I just had one quick question. The slide that really stood out to me was near the beginning where um, you were showing us how 
lung cancer varies depending on state. And I noticed that West Virginia had a greater prevalence of lung cancer. Uh, my background is actually um, in public health. That's what I'm getting my bachelor's degree in right now. And I'm just curious to know if there's any type of cultural disparities or language disparities, or you know, what are the main um, leading risk factors that are causing some ethnic groups to be at higher risk versus others? Yes, um, yes, uh, great question. Um, the, the, the geographic disparity map of lung cancer mirrors the tobacco use map of lung cancer. So that is definitely a powerful part of it. What I didn't say was if you had done that map, if you had drawn that map uh, 30, 40 years ago, it would have looked very different. So California, which looks really nice and clear today, used to be a heavy tobacco use state, New York and the Northeastern states were that way. So the point is something happened, policy level interventions and all the way down to social cultural acceptance or not of smoking happened. And those states saw plump plunge in their um, smoking rates and a couple of decades later, you began to see the evolution of lung cancer going down faster in such states than, than the other. So the high density states are states in which, yes, um, the, a lot of them are still in the tobacco belts, by the way, where the crop is most often grown. So there's all the economic incentives uh, and disincentives to make people quit. But there are also states in which not only is smoking still socially acceptable, they also happen to be states in which policy has failed. Okay, let's call it what it is. Policy has failed to pursue the public health challenge of our age, which is to make people, discourage people from smoking. But I also want to mention that um, we know that 85% of lung cancer is tobacco related, but we know that for 15%, it's not, right? So we, we do believe that there is still beyond that, something else going on and trying to figure out what are these other additional reasons? Are they environmental in some way in these high density states? Is an opportunity for a smart public health person, you know, to investigate and teach us all. Thank you so much. You're yeah, welcome. Thank you. Uh, do you have time to go for about five more minutes of questions? Sure, I have to. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we'll go next to Arnav. Hi, thank you so much for <laughs> today's presentation. Um, I'm curious to hear more about like the actually implementing the incidental lung nodule programs. So would this mean like uh, entail more of like integrating new technologies with like patient management or like <clears throat> identifying the nodules or what is it entailing adding more like specialists and like creating a new team within health systems or hospitals to specifically work on lung nodules? Like that's, a, that's a brilliant question. You know, the, we live in a world of finite resources, of course. So you can't just, you know, carte blanche, start spending money. Uh, you have to try to figure out how to optimize pre-existing resources, right? Um, so the nice thing about an audio program, it starts from the point where you vaulted to, test has been done, there's a spot, someone's already identified it, but we fail too often to follow pre-existing guidelines. Okay. And so what we did was bring, we try to simplify the process. Okay. So the place where our program is currently set up begins is the radiologist report. So the first thing we did was try to figure out how do we make it where these reports, rather than leaking out and everybody ignoring them, how do we concentrate them in one repository? and then put a team around to kind of dig through and triage, right? And the way we did it was we asked the radiologist to dictate a standard sentence. Uh, that sentence allowed us then to program the electronic health system to look for that sentence. And anytime it was in a radiology report, it put it in a queue. And then we brought the humans around the queue with a guideline in hand to say, what, what does the report say? What does the guideline say we should do? 
what is the patient's age? What is the patient's smoking history? What is the lesion characteristic? How big is that? How uh, is it calcified? Is it not, you know, certain things. I don't want to get inside baseball with you on this. And, and then we had to just say, if it is this, high risk. If it is this, low risk. If it is this, medium risk. And if it is high risk, this is what you do. You call them and tell them that you need to come to the lung nodule clinic. If it is low risk, uh, it's not lung cancer discharge. You don't need to do anything. If it is intermediate risk, might need a CAT scan in three months, might need a CAT scan in six months, might need a CAT scan in a year. Let's make all of that happen. So, so that structure has weaknesses. The first is, you're again, you're back to human foibles, right? The radiologist has to remember to use that sentence. If he doesn't, fail, right? And that was something that we saw happen. We had to go through feedback loops, letting them see all the times. So we started out, it was about 30 something percent of the radiology reports that, you know, use the macro, what we call the macro text. It's slowly gone up over the years, but it's not nearly as high as it, it, we would love to see it. So one of the things that we're now doing is we are uh, trying to figure out how technology can help us as a backup. So there are two things. One is right now we're waiting on the radiologist to recognize a lesion, describe it, and then use the macro. It is absolutely possible that there is a lesion there, the radiologist fails to see it or remembers to mention it, okay? So technology can serve as a safety net from that point. There's also the human failure of, I forgot to use the macro text. So technology can help us anytime the guy uses any of these words, lesion, uh, not lesion, nodule, mass, but you know, certain keywords, um, we can use technology to trap those, even if they don't use the macro text. And then the other is, um, how do we ensure that even at the point of our navigators, somebody having a bad day doesn't misremember what to do. So these are all examples of how technology can help from radiomics, artificial intelligence, where you can do machine learning to teach the digitized images, okay? Um, what characteristics wind up being present in somebody who ultimately gets diagnosed with a lung cancer versus not, irrespective of what the human eye is looking at. So we're, we're collaborating with a number of uh, artificial intelligence companies that are very interested in this space. Another approach is biomarker testing, okay? You can actually, do a blood test that can identify the presence of certain genetic patterns in blood that predict either the presence, the likely presence of a cancer or the absence, the likelihood that this is never gonna be a cancer. So these tests that rule out or rule in. And that too is a space. You know, when I talked about future, I, I never really came around to talk about I think I mentioned AI, I mentioned biomarkers, but you have given me the opportunity to maybe talk a little bit about what, what those cryptic sentences meant. Thanks. Thank you. That's, that's great. I know we're going over time, but I've, um, this is so interesting. I wonder if I can squeeze in uh, uh, one more quick question is, for your lung nodule program, the lung nodule clinic, who, who runs that? Is it, um, is it pulmonology with? Yes. Um, so yeah. the, 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 if, if the truth be told, the lung nodule program is run by the nurse navigators. Let's just call it what it is. That's the truth. But who are the doctor? The doctors. We. It's a multidisciplinary group. It's radiologist, um, pulmonologist, and surgeon mm -hmm. working with the glue that keeps them together. The navigators. Great. And then in terms of, um, you were presenting some powerful data about how a lot of people are not eligible to get screened. Uh, sorry, are not, wouldn't be eligible to get um, screen test, yeah. The guidelines. Yeah. And you're showing that particularly that median number of years of 16 in the, the lung nodule program of uh, 
folks who stopped smoking over 16 years ago. I, I was curious if you had any thoughts about what kind of data USPSTF is going to need to start changing yeah. some of their criteria. Yeah, our eligibility criteria. Just you know, the, the criteria were based, you know, when we design a clinical trial, you want to reach for the population at risk, so you have a fighting chance of testing your hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that that's who's gonna, you know, it's very interesting. Shortly after the NLST was published, Paul Pinsky, who was the one of the NCI side PE biostats folks on the NLST group, and Chris Berg who was one of the epidemiology leaders on the NCI side, they actually published a paper that looked at what proportion of the US population, what proportion of the US lung cancer population would have been eligible for screening using the US, the 2013 criteria. It was 20 something percent, 20 something percent, the minority of people, which is obviously part of the reason why you know, the U.S. Pre the Preventive Services Task Force lowered the age, right, to, from 55 to 50, and they lowered the smoking intensity from 30 pack years to 20 pack years. And the reason why they did that, quite honestly, was the Nelson. So Nelson was the Dutch-Belgian uh, randomized control trial that had slightly looser um, eligibility criteria. So the Nelson age was 50. So that's where the Preventive Services Task Force could get that, you know, justification for that. And their smoking intensity was not 30 packages, it was lower. So, so there. So the thing I need to mention is that Black people and Native Hawaiians and women, of course, irrespective of race, have a higher risk of lung cancer at a lower smoking exposure um, intensity than white men. So the challenge you see right there, that Pinsky's uh, eligibility incidence bar graph that I showed you clustering, that's part of the reason. So when we use smoking history to select for eligibility, it's not equitable because, you know, 15% of people who get lung cancer never smoked and none of them would be eligible for screening. So what are we saying? It's okay to have stage four EGFR mutated lung cancer and die from it. Okay. Well, so, so clearly our work is still cut out for us. We have to figure out a better way to expand our ability to match up between true risk and eligibility for screening. Now, Having said that, we know, number one, our resources are not infinite, okay? You can't, even out of goodwill, catch every last patient. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see to you that. We also know that you can harm a lot of people in many different ways out of goodwill. So we do have to be careful. So people have said things like, well, why do you need to have any criteria? Just you know, make it where you're a certain age, everybody go get a CAT scan. Well, the problem with that is you will drown the system, of course. Nobody can afford that. And secondly, you will find a lot. Now, let me give you the flip side. Okay, I said 6.8% of the patients in my nodule program have been diagnosed with lung cancer. The flip side of that is that 93% of these people in the nodule program have not had lung cancer. So if we now said we want to be jumping in there and doing things on all of them, you see how you can begin to hurt people. So, so I'm not answering your question directly, I recognize. And the reason for that is it's work that we still have to do to try to figure out um, what, what is this, where is the sweet spot? It's not there yet. We're not there. It may turn out to be different for different categories of our population. So I, I will digress just a little bit, not really digress, just extend a little bit. So there's this talent trial, the Taiwan lung cancer uh, um, uh, screening trial that actually was designed to test screening in almost the photographic negative of what the NLST did. So people who did not have a 
tobacco related risk uh, that you could identify, but they had certain risk factors. They had a they had a close relative with a history of lung cancer. They were, you know, they had certain other eligibility criteria. And lo and behold, in Taiwan, where smoking is very, very, very infrequent in women, the talent trial showed the ability to find a lot of lung cancer, a disconcertingly high pro um, proportions of the people in the talent study, including women who were lifelong people who never smoked with lung cancer. So clearly, if we took our US Preventive Services Task Force criteria to Taiwan, wouldn't fly. You would not find any women who would be eligible for screening, right? So clearly our work is still in front of us. We still have to get smart to figure out truly what identifies risk and how can we um, bring people in uh, to get tested. Great, thank you. That, that was very insightful, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation and answering the questions. Just one very, very brief question is, um, those slides that you presented, are they accessible outside of this lecture? Oh, I can uh, send them to whoever wants them. Uh, perfect, yeah. Uh, I've been emailing you, so uh, we can we can establish that. After okay, this good. I'll, I'll dump the slides. I'll look for your email and I'll, I'll send them. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, again, just one last thank you for, for all that you shared with us, for your breadth of knowledge in lung cancer screenings. And um, we're excited to see what you continue to do in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you guys and good luck. I love all the young, fresh faces. We're, we're counting on you guys to help us slay this dragon of lung cancer, okay? Make it go away, never come back everywhere for everyone. Great, we really appreciate it. And great to see everybody. To, tomorrow, um, not everybody knows this, but tomorrow is National Lung Cancer Screening Day. So it was just wonderful to be able to hear this fantastic presentation right ahead of it. So thank you all. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.